Hi there learners and welcome to module 1.3 of your grade 12 curriculum where we are looking at hardware recommendations. So we are looking at this in terms of buying a computer. We also want to touch on the value of ICT and then some newer technologies. So let's jump in. Our whole scenario today is based around buying a computer. You go into the shop, you're looking for something new, you need to maybe upgrade, whatever the case may be. But before you do that, you need to ask yourself a couple of questions. You need to consider whether, number one, you need it to be mobile or not. You need to also ask yourself, well, does this machine need to do a specific task? Um, what is the purpose of this? What am I going to be doing with it? Because all those considerations need to be taken into consideration. So the hardware specs in relation to the software that you are going to be using. Do you need an entry-level computer or a more advanced one? What sort of operating system is going to be provided? Is there an operating system on this machine? We need to remember that you want to buy what's best for your budget or what your budget will allow. And the three, probably the most important hardware components are your processor, your RAM, and the size of your storage. So these are things we need to take into consideration. So let's look at it in a little bit more detail. Inside our system unit or our tower case, but remember we call it a system unit, we're looking at things like the CPU, our processor. Remember, this is responsible for running programs and processing data. Its speed is measured in gigahertz, and it can sometimes have multiple cores. It's like having more than one processor, but it's not physically one, more than one processor, right? There are different brand names like AMD or Intel. That influences the power of that particular processor. For example, AMD processors are more geared towards gaming than your Intel, right? So you need to take that into consideration. For most people, the standard entry-level processors are fine for personal users, Soho users, and the mobile users. But if you are going to be a power user, then you need to buy the best CPU that you can afford because you are going to need a more powerful one. The next one is memory or our RAM. And there we can see there's our RAM. There's the brand name Corsair, very well-known brand, expensive. Um, and our DDR indicating what type of memory um, this is. So our RAM is a temporary storage area for programs and data being processed. Um, as I mentioned, it's also identified in terms of DDR, DIMMs, DDR4. This is probably the most important part when it comes to RAM is that in order for an operating system to recognize and access and use more than four gigs of RAM, it must be a 64-bit version. So these are questions you need to ask before you actually purchase that particular um, machine. Now, for any user, the more memory you have, the more memory you have installed, the better it's going to be. And obviously, for our power users again, um, working with video editing programs, you are going to need a lot more RAM. Then we move on to the hard drive, right? Our hard disk drive, it's the main permanent storage area for all of your data and software. Now, we know that our file server in a network that provides services to clients in the network has a number of hard drives because this is where it stores all of the users' files and folders. Besides the capacities, hard drives can be identified in adverts by terms such as SATA, which is the connector, and the rotational speed. So remember, these are disks that rotate. So they can tell you that it's like a 7,200 RPM hard drive. Um, and the higher that number, the quicker it's actually going to respond. But then you also have your SSDs, which use technology similar to flash memory, which means there's no moving parts. They do work faster. And most users will never really fill their hard drive or PC, although many do it today, okay? So you need to just bear that in mind. And again, you need to ask the question, what am I going to be using this for? That's going to determine the size of the hard drive that you'll need. Some folks I know use a combination of the two. So in my gaming laptop, I've got a 500 gig SSD that's got Windows and my programs and everything on it. And then for all my data storage, I've got another 1.5 terabyte hard drive, traditional hard drive, um, where, you know, all my data is kept. So 
my PC boots up very quickly. Um, it's able to open programs quickly, but all of the, the other data is kept on a separate drive. So you can, you know, look at customizing according to what you need. Then inside your system unit, what is this? This is a graphics card, a video card. What is the purpose of this? Remember we spoke about this when we spoke about expansion slots, right? This is a separate circuit board. As you can see there, this plugs into the motherboard, into one of those slots in the motherboard, and it has its own video memory and GPU. That's why you have this fan over here, okay? So this fan actually keeps the card and everything in it cool. Now, your entry-level computers have integrated graphics built into the CPU or motherboard, so it's not always required to have this, um, but if you are going to be doing any gaming, any video editing, sometimes um, you would need something a little extra as well. They do add extra processing power, which is essential for 3D graphics, video editing or high-end gaming, as I mentioned. Right, as we continue with the system unit now, this is one that's quite optional <clears throat> because most of the time you don't need this. Most, as I mentioned, I think in previous presentations or previous slides, um, most laptops don't even come with these optical drives anymore. But we're just going to go through it for the purpose of knowing what it is. So our DVD drive is an optical drive that can play, read and write CDs and DVDs. They are less important than they used to be because they've been replaced by external hard drives, flash drives, and now you can get everything on the internet and transfer everything that way as well. Um, you do get external ones, so if you need to, you can, but this is really not something you often take into consideration. Again, it all depends on what you are going to be doing. We continue with the system unit now because now we look at the ports. Now, when you are especially buying a laptop, this becomes incredibly important because um, sometimes they are limited to the number of USB ports that they have. Um, maybe you're looking for a memory card reader. You can get peripherals that can plug in, so it's not a huge train smash. But our ports are used to connect external devices to the computer. Most devices can connect to a USB port. So you want to have at least three to four USB ports. Um, some then have, you know, extra ports like an HDMI or VGA or so on. Um, some have USB-C, others have Thunderbolt. Um, you should have a network cable as well. But others, if they don't have that, they have the Wi-Fi capability, um, which is really built in as well. So these are just some of the things, again, this for me, especially when you buy a laptop, is something to consider. Once again, you need to ask the question, what am I going to be using this for? What is the purpose? So our system unit case as well. Now, when it comes to gaming and any video editing and things like that, and you've, you've got all these big components, um, most of the time you don't really have much of a choice. But when you are building it yourself and gaming, you generally want a case that's going to allow for more airflow. And this is why you'll see in these gaming cases that they have all these fans and these colors and things like that, um, these RGB lights that they have in and stuff like that. And it's, it's mostly there just to allow the airflow because it's building up so much heat. Now, the size and design of the case, that will affect what components can be installed as well. Like if you get a very small case, you're going to have to get, you know, your, the, the form factor of your components is going to be smaller as well. Then we look at the devices that connect to the computer. So the mouse and the keyboard. I mean, these are the most commonly used types of input devices. You might look at ergonomic considerations, depending on how much time you're going to be spending working with the mouse and keyboard. Do you want wireless? Do you want cabled? Um, are you a mobile user? Are you going to be a power user? That's going to play a major role in what type of mouse and keyboard you end up buying. And trust me, there are a lot of different ones out there. What about your monitor? Now, again, depending on what you're going to be doing, um, that's going to play a huge role. This is the most common output device for soft copy. Remember, soft copy is our digital, what we see on the screen. And, I mean, you get different sizes of monitors. You get touchscreens. You get 
different quality monitors. You can play around with monitors that have a different refresh rate. For most users, an entry level is fine. But again, our power user is the troublemaker here. <laughs> our power user is the one that needs, they always need something more. Um, in my case, where I'm sitting now, I've got three monitors in front of me. So one is recording. The other one is displaying the presentation that you see on the page. And then the third one is showing me everything else that's going on on my PC. So it just depends what type of user you are and what you are going to be doing with it. Then our printer, same story. We know it produces the hard copy, right? We know that. But you need to look at the type of printer. Are you going to be printing black and white? Are you going to be printing color? Do you need high quality prints? Um, most printers these, day are, these days are multifunction printers, which means they don't just print, but they can copy, they can scan, some can scan an email, um, others can fax, you know, things like that. Again, it's going to depend on you. If you're a mobile user, you might go for a mobile printer. Um, but again, these are just some of the questions that you need to ask and some of the things you need to bear in mind. Then looking at things like external storage. Now, for me, because I move between computers, I've got an external drive. So I'll do something on my laptop, copy that over, bring it over to the next PC, work with it there. It's not ideal, but that's what I end up doing. And we're talking about storage devices that connect to the computer. So again, personal users, normal users, we, you know, just use a flash drive. That's fine. Um, but as soon as you start having a lot more data, we start moving to external hard drives. And then for the Soho, because they are business and the power user, they end up using larger hard drives uh, because obviously the size of the files are a lot bigger as well. Then we've got scanners and barcode scanners. Now we know our image scanners capture images, our, our barcode scanners read barcodes. Um, the personal user will seldom need a scanner because we can usually just use our phone, take a picture, we use an app, do that. But again, the Soho user or power user, and you can see how the Soho user is coming in here now, they need to convert hard copy documents into editable text that might need a scanner with the particular software, the OCR um, software. Uh, it would be if they are doing that, it's always going to be a good idea for them to get a good quality scanner. Remember, we need a good quality scanner. We need what is being scanned in to be a good quality as well. And the result will end up being of a good quality. Right. And then we have devices for disabled users. Now, I've been through this with you before. So please don't forget. There is a difference between the impaired and blind user between the impaired and the deaf user and then the motor control so these are the things we have gone through before they just mentioned them again um, and you can breeze through that then we look at the value of ict now we have touched on the fact that ict um, provides us with uh, the reason why we use it is because it provides us with efficiency productivity and accuracy and we've got no issue with that we're very glad that it can do all of those things for us. But this also affects the choice of hardware that we use. So if you're typing in a lot of text, you want to get a good quality keyboard. If you're doing video editing, you want to have the largest, fastest possible hard drive. You want to make sure that you've got enough memory. You maybe want to go for two monitors. Um, sometimes people go just for one massive monitor. You want to look at your CPU as well. All of those things. Maybe you are converting existing documents into digital format and you might need to go for an automatic sheet, sheet feeding scanner. All right. So I'm just showing you that while ICT provides efficiency, productivity and accuracy, and that's why we end up using these things, it does play a role in the choice of hardware that we end up buying in order to help us do these things. Okay. What about competitive gaming? Yo, there's so much to choose from the right gaming keyboard, the right mouse, the right joystick. Maybe you're creating digital art. Maybe you're selling products at a till. Okay. All of this, all of this requires us to do a little bit of thinking before we end up buying the products. Then accessibility. 
Now, ICT makes knowledge and resources accessible to people all over the world. For example, we can do remote surgery. Um, data and information we can access using the internet. There's distance education. There's cell phone banking. Um, making computers more accessible for disabled users. So ICT is really expanding um, to make sure that everyone can access the implementation of the technology. I mean, I, for me personally, I just, I would worry a bit about this if I'm working over an internet connection because if the guy's busy with the remote surgery and the internet connection cuts up. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to end well, but anyway. <laughs> um, but distance education, I mean, so many people are being educated via distance, in, uh, distance education institutions. So you can see how the technology is making things accessible for more people in a number of different ways. And, and it's just increasing every single day. And then when it comes to new technology, what we find and what we really need to understand about new technology is just a few things. Number one, new technology is normally supposed to be smaller, cheaper, faster, and more powerful than what we have today. Although we know that's not always the case. But generally, that's how it's supposed to go. It will generally use more and more sensors. It will be designed to be mobile. The battery life. Have you ever noticed how the adverts consistently when it comes to cell phones, tablets, they're always talking about battery life, the battery life lasting longer, looking at 10 hours, 12 hours, because that's what it's geared uh, towards doing. That's, that's how it's been designed. It's been designed to be constantly connected and communicating. So in order to do that, you need a longer battery life. It needs to be mobile. It needs to be smaller in some cases. It needs to be more powerful as well. And it needs to be able to combine newer technologies to allow easier and more effective input and output. And folks, that's it for our module. I'll see you in the next one.